able to sort of distill it down uh, to two key indices. <laughs> Amen. So this is a very simplified uh, attempt, as it were. And some of the things I'll be speaking to, they're actually laws because they are backed up by scriptures. Um, not necessarily because it's been taught in economic classes and you know there are professors and all of that. But these are things that are scriptural and once it's grounded in the scriptures, it's as good as what? As law. It's no longer theory. Praise God. And so there is one thing so I was able to bring it down or to distill it down to one thing. That economic growth, economic development is down to one thing. Somebody say one thing. And that is productivity. All right? That is productivity. The aggregate economy of any people, a society, village, whatever, is directly proportional to the degree to which the people that make up that society are productive. And that's what you find when we talk about GDP, all right, is a measure of the sum total of the productive capacity of a people. Amen. Amen. So down to one thing, what? Productivity. productivity. All right. Now, productivity in itself is now down to two cardinal things. And that is one, the capacity of the average person in that community to produce. If you can increase the capacity for one individual or the average of the people within that society to produce, you create development. Amen. That's one. Secondly is something we heard also last week, and that is the creation of opportunities. So improving the productivity of a people, their capacity to add value, to create wealth, all right? And on the other hand, creation of opportunities. Creation of opportunities is also down to two things. Praise God. Are you following my issue tree? <laughs> Creation of opportunities is down to two things or two critical factors. And there is one factor that is the most critical of everything we'll talk about today. And I would maybe narrow down a little bit. And, and you know, incidentally, you'd see how a lot of these mountains in themselves are very interrelated, you know, uh, and very connected to one another. So when it comes to creation of opportunities, largely you depend on two factors in a society to do that. And that is innovators or entrepreneurs and government. If you can get these three things right, you would see economic prosperity. Um, what we will find is that and, and, and in my closing remarks, you will find that what we have is an anomaly that is anti-scriptures, particularly in Nigeria and Africa. And we'll see how we are breaking these laws in, in different spheres. There are so many areas we can speak to, but I'll just speak broadly to a few. Amen. So these three things, capacity building, in other words, the capacity of the people to produce, and abundance of innovation, entrepreneurs pushing the system, and then government. Who can guess the most important of these three? If it's not working, it will frustrate every other thing. Government. <laughs> so again, a clarion call. Please, we cannot be apolitical. As a people, as a body of Christ. It affects everything. 
So we depend on government to create what I call sources of competitive advantage amongst committee of nations. It's, it's rested or it's the responsibility of government to do this. And I just highlighted um, four things. Infrastructure development, what is called both hard and soft infrastructure. Creation of policies, development policies. Now it's these policies that also go a long way in affecting you know, the dynamics of society. Um, these policies sometimes don't have to be written and encoded, you know, in, in laws or bills, as much as that is, that is fantastic. But sometimes this policy also is reflective of the vision of a leader of a nation, all right? In other words, the values that he holds there and uh, the, the paradigm in which he chooses to walk. So, for example, you can subsume that, or you can, you can look at that and its connection as well to capacity building in a society. So, if successive governments refuse to prioritize, for instance, the education of the average human within a society, in other words, grant the person the capacity to produce, all right, you are doing a disservice. And that is why one of the macroeconomic indicators that is critical to continue to measure is unemployment. There is unemployment, there is underemployment because the government has failed in its responsibility over the years to invest in the capacity building of its people. Number three, security. Security of lives and property, that's supposed to be basic. Speaks to everything. For every responsible government, um, right from creating institutions, all right, that increase, as it were. First and foremost, you must create opportunities. Um, if you're not creating that, like I've said before, it means you lower the barrier to crime within a society. In other words, the propensity to commit crime will continue to increase where opportunities continue to dwindle, okay? But as long as you are creating opportunities within a society, in other words, as you would often hear it said, the job of government is to create an enabling environment. In other words, let the environment be enabling. Just take care of the basics and leave every other thing, you know, to thrive, all right? Um, so if you're able to do this, then from the system of policing down to the courts, down to the correctional centers, all those institutions have to be strengthened because when you strengthen that, then the, you, you further increase the barrier to crime because people then know that if I flout the law, there are consequences, okay? In our society today, there are many people who see that you can get away with things and so, you know, um, you, you, you try the law, even though it's written, but if law enforcement is weak, then you would continue to increase um, the degree of insecurity in a society. And then the fourth thing, you know, I, I just try to coin it in my own words. I call it socially acceptable norms. The government is responsible for that. And, and, you know, because of time, I can't go too deep into, into some of this. Um, but you'll see how some societies have, you know, done this to ensure that they're able to promote other things. And maybe I'll give an example of one of such. And you see, the reason why government is, is, is most responsible for all of this is because people would generally gravitate in the direction of an environment where they feel that they can have the best rewards for their labor. Do you understand? So that's why you find, for instance, Lagos has the, is the seventh largest economy, I think, you know, in Africa. And so it's very populated because people believe there are opportunities here. Do you understand? 
So human capital. And you can create a system that continues to attract the best of human capital into a society. All right? So you look at a UAE or a Dubai, for instance. What's the population of the, you know, citizens? Just about a million people. Okay? But the government has created opportunity, infrastructure development. And then they have, they have tweaked with what I would call the social norms, all right, in such a way that allows them to be a bit more liberal than the average, you know, Arabian country. And what do you find? There is a migration of people moving in there because they know people will move in that direction. So um, when you see societies who have created opportunities um, and Perhaps, as we've seen the narrative, you have the natives, you know, sort of um, becoming complacent, all right? The governments of those nations, therefore, create policies to attract the best from other nations. And that's why you find migration. The UK also just released something, you know, Canada is there. US first did its own clean out, all right, with, with green card and all of that. They are not necessarily doing you a favor they understand the value of people. Because when you are able to create opportunities like that, that's the only time that your population can be a source of competitive advantage for you. Do you understand? So why is China so massive, growing, clearly outgrown the US? I think they are just managing some things on paper. All right? But even those managing on paper have said that, well, China's economy is going to surpass the U.S. Despite their explosive population, it's because they've invested in their people, you know. And the average Chinese, <laughs> as I heard, even from Nigerians, they are like 10x more productive than the average Nigerian. Even when it comes to manual labor, when it comes to tooling and all of that, they have, they have done something to their people, all right? So you will find that people are more important, you know, than resources. And that's the lesson we need to learn as, 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 as Africans. Abundant resources, still poor, because we've not invested in the people, because the government has not gotten certain things right, all right? We failed on so many indices. And I find this to be also true even for businesses, when you get to the micro level in terms of businesses, okay, you would find that, and luckily, you know, I've, I've had cause to go through, you know, or advise several business leaders. And one thing I do find is that those who prioritize their business or their product and they think it's more important than the people to support it, they end up with stunted growth. There's just a way you can't scale without the right people. And you can see how all of this is therefore interrelated. So innovators and entrepreneurs who are trying to create opportunities, create wealth uh, within a society are frustrated and their capacity to scale is limited because there is no investment in capacity building of people. So you have you know, insufficient, despite a massive population, insufficient number of critical human capital necessary to scale a lot of businesses to multi-billion dollar enterprises. Hallelujah. So always understand that people are the most important factors of production. Amen. Um, So one of the things we think about when we, when we talk about economy, how many minutes do you give me? 10? 15? <laughs> okay, let me round up. One of the key things we think about a lot of times is the mind goes to money, all right? Economy, money, making money, all right? We're talking economy and business. This is the money-making discussion. Hallelujah. 
So money is important, all right? Um, but as I've often said, money should only, 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 except you want to break the law, <laughs> only move in the direction of productivity. As people become more productive, so in fact, any government that is printing money, the amount of money in circulation should somewhat reflect right, the productivity of the people. If you had print money, you know what happened in Zimbabwe. You've seen trucks. You know, I even saw that it happened in Europe, Germany in particular, I think in the uh, 1920s or so. You know, they were actually using wheelbarrow, you know, with plenty of money to go and buy things in the market. No jokes. I mean, <laughs> so, so um, money supplies is very important, you know, uh, in a society, but I, I wouldn't go there. And usually it's the responsibility of government, you know, to control that. But it should only move to reward productivity and value. Are you following? It should only move to reward productivity and what? And value. It is an anomaly, and this is very important, for you to take money, and I'm careful not to really use the word capital, but yeah, invariably a form of capital, all right? To reward mediocrity or a system that is not productive. Because what you would have is under development or death. It will happen. Are you following? Yes, it will happen. So, this is one of the key anomalies we find in our system. Praise God. You'll find it in the civil service, for example. Such anomalies lead to what? Stunted growth and underdevelopment. So just imagine an organization that continues to pay money or salary or compensation to reward lack of productivity or to reward mediocrity, you can't grow. You would eventually die, or you continue to suffer on that development. It will be stunted growth. And the best of people will exit that system because they feel this system is not designed to reward productivity or excellence. Are you following? So even the federal location system of our country rewards lack of productivity, lack of innovation, it rewards mediocrity. That monthly sharing in Abuja is an anomaly and it's part of why we are suffering as a people. If a state government needs that extra income to even pay salaries, which is what happens with many of the states. Without that fact, they can't even pay salaries. What it means is that your civil service is not productive. There's no productivity. But you keep a bloated workforce And continue to take capital that should go into a lot of, you know, developmental work within society. I use it to just continue to pay. Even the federal government bloated, borrowing money to pay salaries. It's an anomaly. And can only be a recipe for underdevelopment. And for a lot of them, 
because of their lack of willingness to innovate, create opportunities within their society, what you find is that it becomes a political thing. Do you understand? Because if you create opportunities, if there are people who will move out of the civil service and take on opportunities within the environment. I know a lot of us have been seeing some funny memes of Biden and our president, you know, going across social media. <laughs> when one is talking about we've increased employment, or they're saying there's no, there's no, <laughs> Government doesn't have job. Government doesn't need to have job. Government just needs to create jobs. All right? Create jobs. And for us to know how important this is, and I think we covered a lot of it when we're dealing with parables, uh, parables, um, I think, during the pandemic, resources, talents, and all of that. And for you to just see how God abhors lack of productivity. The guy who buried his talent he was called wicked. Do you understand? That's the definition of what? Wickedness. You didn't produce and add to it. All right? And then he took his talent and gave to the one who had the highest return on investment. All right? The one with five talents. And it just shows the paradigm of God that you should only reward what? Productivity. All right? And that is the law. So many things to say, but because of time, let me cut it there. Thank you. The street on Buefon, there's a budget for it. Who is supposed to do this budget supposed to come and fix the Buefon drainage? Is your local government chairman that you don't even know who he is? You understand? Or the civil servant that would, you know, Mr. Chaka would take proposal to, I want to feed children, and they say, come back later. And, you know, those are the guys running the show, the civil servants. I, you know, I was telling someone the other day that if God was to judge Nigeria, some of us are going to lose uncles, aunties, and parents. Because the judgment is going to be right there. So he's just saying, you know, let me not leave it for now and do it carefully. I'm not telling the truth. Some of the uncles that paid your school fees, they stolen money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I work with them. They will not allow the work to get done. Brilliant idea. They won't touch it. And they say, oh, well, okay, when you talk to us, brazenly ask you for money. Brazenly. Like it's their right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting scenario, and maybe we'll discuss some of it here. Uh, do we have an amazing panel. Uh, I call it the balanced panel. We have the theorist, the economist. We have the you know, future economy, the new economy, the opportunity economy. And of course, we have someone in the middle on balance, uh, technology on the other side. So I'll begin to invite them one by one, uh, starting with our dear brother and uh, technology guru, Brother Daiden, please. Hallelujah. Ah, uh, are you getting a cult in this group? Are you getting a following? Is this a? Uh, is that, that, that's how Donald Trump started. The next thing, uh, he carried the edge of pastor. Pastor, watch your back. Oh. He's already getting a following. Hallelujah. And of course, uh, I mean, this is the first time we hear his own perspective, but I enjoy his praise and worship. By the way, he gives us some Zaria praise and worship. Uh, and he works in one of the big four. You know, my. My own Goliath. <laughs> My own Goliath. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't worry, I'm just trying to not entertain you, but just carry along so that you don't slip off. Brother Melvin, please put your hands together for a <laughs> You're going to tell us how, what it feels like to work for Goliath. <laughs> me, I'm David. Share uh, where David I mean. <laughs> And of course, another David in the house, uh, our dear pastor and uh, intellectual. I mean, the, the dimensions give us on Thursday. TBC, TBC, TBC. God will ask for the talent. Oh. You go and bury this talent. He said that adultery begins in the mind. Guess what? Every other thing begins in the mind too. Making wealth, everything else is where? That's why Britain, a small tiny island, can colonize half of the world. Britain is not as big as Nigeria, but it colonize, including America. What is it? It's here. It's here. Please, our dear pastor, Pastor Fidye. Yeah, another David too, I believe. Hallelujah. All right, so I'll take my seat. Now, we're going to do a lot of Q&A from the audience. So I'm going to run this thing very quickly. But Raymond, I promise you, I will not overshoot my runway. Um, so, interesting conversation. You heard what Pastor said. 
And the dimension I want you to come from is, I, I'm going to allow you to, of course, go as you are led, but I want you to also pour out your heart. I don't want to constrain you with questions. So I will begin with um, some quick overview, based on what you've heard pastors say, and based on the way Nigeria's economy is going. You know, uh, we can't wait for government, and this is the agenda. So depending when government gets its act together, I want to find out what some of us can begin to do. You know, there are some things we've said in the past that if you look at some places, if you look at a place like, I don't want to call names, but if you go to some camps, there are about two or three of them. They are running mini economies. You know, I don't want to call the names. Everything is almost self-sustaining. The only thing is they don't have their own currency. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm not saying we should advocate for setting up our own economy, but I want to hear some real pragmatic stuff for the believers here. And I also want you to notice an opportunity to addressing the body and also addressing the nation as a whole. Where do we start from? So I want to quickly scan the environment, and I'll run this way from uh, the tech guy. So having heard everything you said, in one minute, 1.5 minutes, what, where do we start from? Which way forward? I don't want to re retreat the problems that Pastor has already highlighted. I'll start with you, sir, then you and you. And I want you to come in from your own understanding of economics and to the fact that you're participating in the economy, you're a productive, very productive gentleman, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I begin with you, sir. Thank you very Which much, sir. And good morning, everyone. Um, I think that the um, introduction that Pastor gave kind of stated the problems and even led us in the direction of the solution. But some things I would like to say in addition to that is this. Today, if you go on NTA or any station, they will still tell you Nigeria has the biggest economy in Africa. They will still show you some figures that if you look on the street, you don't know how it relates. So, you know, I, I was just trying to check, and I was seeing a lot of fantastic figures that somebody that is outside of Nigeria will look at and say, these people are okay. But I decided to now go outside of Africa to now look. So Nigeria has a GDP of uh, 2,200, there about. Yeah, yeah, per capita. And when I looked at India, they have 7,500. So if you are trying to compare, so it's like comparing Olodos with Olodos. There is a key, there is a king of them. Mm. Do you understand? So it seems like it's doing well. But when you take him out of there to put him on the playing field with other people, so see 2,200 to 7,500 of countries that are both regarded as third world countries. So you see that there is a huge gap. There is a huge there is a huge deficiency. There is even nothing to celebrate. We should not even be talking about being the biggest economy in, in Africa because the whole of economy of Africa, Africa, as big as it is, is still down. And like PDK has said, there is a key factor to it, which is the government. And unfortunately, there is a little that you and I can really do at this moment to change, except, you know, begin to infuse ourselves gradually and we move up like that. So I always say, as an individual, know your own personal economics. Leave the figures. What is your own per capita income? Your own household? What was it 10 years ago? What was it last year? What is it now? Where do you want it to get to? Because, you know, when we have discussions like this, it always ends in a headache for me because, you know, when you say everything, it ends on the government. And you see that that is a roadblock. So every, every direction you take, you go and it ends government. And there's no way to go again. So, so, you know, I've just intentionally decided that, no. So let me, so now I see myself as a global citizen. You know, you have to transcend this uh, economy. Yes, this economy. Yeah. And bring yourself, and, and I think that is what mm. all of us need to begin to do Fantastic. as individuals. Fantastic. Geography told us that the world is joined. I say technology has made the world a playing field. Mm. And there is no limit. You are a global, you are not a Nigerian. You are a Nigerian, you know. You are living and in Nigeria. But you're living you're in Nigeria, city. but you are a global city. There's nothing. Stopping you. We had people last week talking about teachers even making money from. Who could have thought that even teachers could be making a uh, hen from outside? So, whatever it is you are, tailor, whatever, mm. there is an element of that thing you are doing that is relevant in the global space. Fantastic. And interestingly for you, there is more money to be made there. Fantastic. So, for example, sorry that I'm okay. bringing it. Okay. We, an average, averagely, they make a website for maybe like 100K, 150K a year. Averagely, but the average in the, U, in the US is $1,000. That's like the starting point. But that $1,000 to us here is more than 500K. 
So why don't you better position yourself to begin to attack that than sit within the confines of this? Do you understand? So I really believe that rather than, because we don't even know how they came about those figures in the first place and they're about. Do you understand? So rather than bother yourself, because when they said we are in depression, and now that we are not in depression, I think it's even worse now than when we were in depression. So leave the whole of the figures, have your own figures, mm. set your own target, set your own goals, and as an individual, be your own government. Push your own self to mm. become who you want to be. And Hallelujah. Right. Hallelujah. Please put your hands together. You know, you know what he has said has opened up a vista that we're going to come back to discuss. And I think it's going to set a lot of us free. You know, even though it was the agenda, you know, but apparently I see how some of us are going to be fantastically blessed from that. Chairman. Yeah, I feel like he he just drew from your notes, <laughs> my, my notes really. Yes, his debut. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he drew from my notes because uh, and even PDK has said it. It's easy to gripe about um, the, the government, what the government is not doing. Sincerely, if I want to speak like an economist, I would then tell you how the theory works and all that. It's and like it's like you were saying, the statistics are not lies; they're actually true. It's just that the issue is we are not feeling it on individually. So it's just numbers out there, but they don't affect us individually. And I feel like the biggest thing for me is, why do I sit down and say, OK, um, it's not working, when I can just sit down and work on myself? I, so there's this slogan I go, I say, be, the, be, the, be a better version of yourself today and every day. So every day, if you wake up, you're looking at how can I do to improve my own productivity? So if I start with that mindset, Diadem starts with that mindset, PDA starts with that mindset, you see that there is a chain of productivity and it starts growing. So it's, if you start concentrating on all the irritations, I'm telling you, you'll count and you'll get tired. But then it's for you to sit down. And I'm so happy at the way the world is going. It's really a global village. I can tell you that, um, I don't know if I should say this. So. <laughs> OK, so I, 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 I sit in, I, I'm a consultant, right? But I sit in my house and I get a lot of people calling me that I have never seen from especially the UK, and they are saying they want you to do this, they want you to do that. And I'm wondering, how did you people even know I could do this? And that is because maybe at a time in my life, I had put some things out there, and they just go on Google and they search, and somebody is telling me. And the last time I was, I was I had prizing with somebody, and I was talking in pounds, I'm like, oh, Melvin, you can talk in pounds. <laughs> so I feel like we should just start building our capacity and put ourselves out there, and technology has made things easier. Before you know it, you will not even be bothered about um, what the government is saying. You will see yourself watching CNN, trying to say, okay, so what's the US stock market saying right now? And that's uh, Nigeria's uh, economy and misery will not be your business. Fantastic. Please put your hands together for him on that. Um, Reverend K, Reverend K, can you confirm our pound account takes a uh, tight? <laughs> All right, we'll come back to that, sir. Okay, praise the Lord. All right. Um, thank you, Pastor DG and uh, my co-panelists. Um, so far, so good. I think... Um, so you, yes. don't, you don't look happy. No, no, no. I'm not happy because, you know, the, the thing is that he said something that we should think about. Why does everything have to end, you know, with the government? It's not a good thing that, okay, we come, we talk like this, and, you know, we really don't know what to do again uh, beyond the fact that, okay, the government is terrible. But I, I think there are a few other options. You know, I, I just want to speak from a bit of a solution perspective. So that now, you see, because when it comes to the economy, we are right that it all boils down to you and how you improve yourself. Because you know, when the government talks, what you'll be hearing about is uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy, exchange rate, uh, GDP, and you hear all these numbers on TV. You don't even know how any of them applies to you. The hungry man does not care that your monetary rate, he doesn't know all those things. But, but I think it's also a problem because I think we should actually do some studies and learn, be enlightened a little more. You know, because one of the things I noticed about Nigeria, which I will also draw from what we discussed last week, and, and I'm beginning to observe something. You see, when you look at the modern economies, you know, Economies work like a system, like a machine, you know. 
And what I think the modern economies have done is that because their system is working, everything is like an engine that is fully functional. So their productivity can be easily partitioned and compartmentalized. What that means is that you have lawyers, you have engineers, you have artists, you have pastors. Those people are able to focus on specific aspects of productivity and you, are, you know that if you are graduating as a lawyer, there's a part of the society you fit in. And when you're working in that part of the society, you're part of one big engine that works. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But you see from what PDK has described this morning, Nigeria is just like one spaghetti soup of um, professionalism and incompetence. You know, all mashed together, meaning that it's only in Nigeria that a granite seller can bid for something that a technologist you know, should be able to do, and that granite seller will get the job. You know why? Because he's the, he's the connected person to the uncle or is the cousin of the palm secretary that sits there. That is Nigeria for you. And as long as we have that kind of spaghetti mix of professionalism and, and incompetence in the system, your being focused on one thing isn't going to really help you. What am I just trying to say? Get the facts. Educate yourself. When they say monetary rate, what does it mean? How does that help? Do you understand what I'm saying now? Those things have meanings. And there are solutions. There are even things we can do. Because productivity is boils down to you are starting something. You seated there. How many of us seated here have a retail store that we sell something? Just raise up your hand. You have a store, online or physical. Anyone, raise up your hand. Just one person. How many of us here have jobs that we do? That's nine to five. Raise up your hand. Nine to five. But you see, for my own concern is that when you hear the government is printing money or borrowing money, you sit down there and say, ah, they're borrowing money. No. no, the money they are borrowing, somehow, is supposed to trickle down to your pocket. It's supposed to trickle down to you when you decide to start a venture. I don't know if that's what I'm saying now. Whether it's granite you want to sell or it's cakes you want to make, you must be able to ask around, okay, do a business plan. Just as you're seated there, oh, I want to sell cakes. I want to make puff puff. I want to repackage biscuits. We import a lot of biscuits, but you can make your own. Those things, we don't often think like that, that actually we can think on these ideas, put a plan, have a budget, then go to a bank. One of the things, I'm, I'm offering solutions now, and I'm sorry, I'm, I hope I'm not talking too much, but I will round up now. One of the things I think um, the church system can do we might start to focus on things like um, the improving the guarantor system to financing. Because I noticed that there's a lot of young people that really want capital, but they're not getting it. And we keep talking about, oh, Buhari is borrowing $150, $500 billion and all this, and you know, we keep insulting it. But he has no choice. And that is because if he's not going to borrow, if taxes are not, if they won't raise taxes, because if we increase taxes, investment will flee. That's people will not want to come in. And government has to spend money because if they don't spend money, you understand what I'm saying? If they don't spend, there won't be jobs, meaning that, you know, contract all these things that, like you said, uncle's paying you all. The money has to be in the system, you know, somehow. So when they borrow, borrowing is what they do to kind of, you know, put more money in the system. But what you need to do is when you hear they are borrowing, you must have plans. You must be able to go to your bank and collect money. Let me just keep it there. But the bottom line is that we might need to start developing as a church a, a, a more improved guarantor system so that if a young man who has been in this church for two, three years, faithful, a disciple, a disciple of uh, Triangle, a disciple of High Leap, a disciple of Mind Shift, a disciple of Women Religious, all those perspectives shaping you over time, we should be able to say that, yes, if this guy needs five million, there are people here worth more than five million, much more, that can guarantee that, okay, this young man, you know, will do a good job. So this is what I'm proposing, you know, more like just, just adding to the system. But let me stop it there. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. You want to say something? Yeah, I want to okay. add something to Okay. You. All right. Uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So in addition to what uh, PDK has said, I think um, even before financing, knowledge is more important. So I think also, so if we are thinking of what the church could do, like he has pointed us now, I think that... The church, because there is a huge knowledge gap. You will see that at some point, um, Jonathan did this, uh, you win, and they were giving people 10 million naira. 
Some people took, I know at least about five people who took that 10 million Naira and have turned it to maybe like a billion Naira business today. And I know people who took that money, got married, or took the money and traveled out. I, I would say that those are in the majority if they take their statistics, maybe just about 10% of them. Be, and the fact is, a lot of us here pray for money or they're about. But many of us, if we get 10 million naira today, it will not last six months. And you won't be able to point to what you have done with it. You will feel bad because it's not intentional, but that is the limit of your capacity. That's the limit of your understanding. There are some of us that if they give you 100 million you really don't know what to do with it. You don't know. And it's not because you are, you know, you are careless or they're about. It's just the limit of your, under, your knowledge and understanding. So I think that one thing that the church as an institution can begin to do is to you know, close that knowledge gap as much. Because that knowledge will also even help people begin to see more problems. We help people to see more opportunities that they can key into in their, in their current situation to begin to make things happen. So if the government is not doing that as a whole, I believe that if the church invests in, that's why I, I like um, churches like uh, Daystar, and you know, they have a proper business uh, school kind of, I think a lot of churches need to do those kind of things. And if possible, even make it almost free. Mm. For example, the, the I leap by PDK, I send it to some people that are not even Christians, and they follow mm. because it's, it's things you can take directly into mm. your business. Do you understand? So churches need way more interventions like that, mm. and that would be one way to leapfrog productivity. Okay. Because when I begin to see opportunities, I begin to see my mind is exposed, mm. I'm more knowledgeable mm. about many things, mm. I can solve more problems, I can even be better to myself. And the ripple effect is that productivity generally will increase. Fantastic. So ahead of financing, I think that knowledge. churches should spend a lot more in giving in, knowledge. Yes. Then maybe after then, you can now give people money to now push things up. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Please, uh, thank, let's, let's appreciate uh, him for that. Now, I'm going to go to audience very early today. So if there are questions that want to be taken, they should start preparing. I'm going to ask Melvin two quick questions. Melvin, why... Um, why are we not filling the statistics? Why is they, you said this, they're correct. So what is the disconnection? Is the money hanging somewhere? Or what do you think is the reason? But more importantly, do you really think that if Nigerians became more productive, we would have an economic revolution? You know what economic revolution is? You didn't go on the streets. And I think it's what happened in India. You know, even though the government was involved in building those tech companies, you know, those, those technology school institutes. But I have a theory that Nigerians are not very productive. Uh, and I'm not here to criticize, or I've, you know, I've told you I've repented. I'm not doing my critic. I'm very you know, less critical now. And that question can be answered anybody. Because, anyway, that's the point. Let's, let me not. Uh... Okay, yeah. Um, so I've had this same um, argument with um, one of my colleagues. And he used to say I'm pro government because I can always show you that uh, this is a statistic. I'm like, but I'm not feeling it. And I'm like, the reason why the statistics are, are not being felt, I mean, some of the issues are things that we know, like you can, I can start mentioning corruption, I can start mentioning poor policy implementation, I can start mentioning all those things. I feel like the issues are more structural than in terms of policy. I feel there are a lot of things that are not in place in Nigeria to allow these things trickle down to the grassroots. Now, you were talking about the local governments. Now, there's an allocation that gets to them. When it gets to them, what do they do with it? This guy carries it and packages it. But in terms of the statistics, that money has gone out. So would you just write it out because you didn't reach the poor man? Now, you say the minimum wage is, the minimum wage is 30K. And if, a, if somebody says, I'm not going to pay you 30K, I'll pay you 20K, what is, what is the government doing to enforce that that 30K is, is, um, is paid? So that, now that, that there is no minimum, the minimum tax has, uh, for employ, uh, um, individuals has been removed if you, if, you have, um, if you have any minimum wage. If another company decides that they want to, they want to take it, Will you, if a company takes it, will I tell the company that I want to, <laughs> I want to resign because you are taking tax? Please give me the small one you are giving me, I will manage it. So I feel like the issues are structural. The government, 
the government itself, when they get in, I, I know that there are a lot of people that get into the government and say, okay, I want to come and make things right. But when you get there, the things that you meet do not, do not uh, allow you to do that. And that's because, again, the people that have for the longest time held um, the government captive are people who don't have the knowledge. Now, uh, the government has been... So, the people, we have people in their 80s leading our government. Sorry, I feel like the world has changed so far that we shouldn't be having that again. Then, I, want, I don't know whether there are northern folks here, but really, productivity, um, reward should follow productivity, reward should follow functions, should follow assets, should follow risks. But people that have assets, people that have the functions, people that do this, they are not the ones getting um, their location. So people just sit down and say they just want to get... Uh, just allocate for me and you pay. Who, who saw the, um, the cutoff mark for states, yeah. this thing? And you, you would see um, some schools having 20 as their cutoff mark. While <laughs> there's, there's two, there's two. While there's somebody else sitting at 138, I feel like that's a problem you should be looking at solving and not you are promoting mediocrity by saying that somebody should be able to take to score two. With let's push it, let my people go, I won't be fine. And that same person will come and compete and be my president because the person doesn't have any. I mean, there's no uh, uh, intellectual acumen to give, and those are the issues you see because things that are happening are not going the right way. So that's why the statistics doesn't trickle down, and some of us too are part of the reason because. Some of I know some of us we are Christians and we say this, but the moment you also get this money, you are looking for how to help, how to help my brother, how to help my sister, and you don't care who is going to do the real thing. Your own is okay. It don't reach my hand now. Let me to let me just arrange it, and that is it. Sorry, I missed the second question. No, no, no. So I was, I was saying that um, is Niger are Nigerians productive? Okay, are Nigerians productive? Well. Uh, I think that is, that is a relative. So some Nigerians are productive, but yes, like we all know, the government has not given enough enabling environment for those Nigerians to thrive. Mm. Now, Nigeria's population is large, and a, large, a larger portion of them are from a region where I think they are not productive, and that's because I've, I've lived there. So the people that are trying to be productive are fewer so and they have to share the resources with people who are not being productive so you will still see the pressure but i feel like we should not look at that if you want to be productive just still try to be a better version of okay, yourself okay i see you're trying to raise your hand okay very quickly sir one minute so as, as regards uh, nigerians being productive yes i really want to say that nigerians are some of the most productive people you can never meet anywhere in the world. And I'll give you reasons. Now, the reason is, if the average America today has the same economy, the same leaders, the same everything that Nigeria has, you cannot see a quarter of the productivity you are seeing in Nigeria today in America. For example, everyone I know that have gone abroad to study, everyone, and this everyone is about 50 or more people, studied and finished with a distinction. Irrespective of what they had here, even people that had taught class here, when they go abroad, get to a school, they finish with a distinction. Most people, if I had somebody that changed from, he wasn't, he wasn't going to study medicine, that was the only thing that was available. He studied medicine and he, I was, he was leading the class. So the reason, yes, it is true, because even in tech, so we, we've been trying to really work with many companies outside now, and I was shocked that when we tell people that you are from Nigeria, they say Nigerians, no. Like, if somebody told me that you're from Nigeria, later you say your mom is dead, you don't have internet, you don't have power. It's a white man telling me this. Wow. Those are some of the things he has had from Nigeria as excuses for them not delivering on things they were contracted on. I was shocked when he was saying that. He said, ah, your mom is sick, your mom is dead, you don't have power, you don't have internet. You know, he started saying those things. And I was really ashamed. Wow. So, it's correct. It's very correct. So, because of the system, you know, because of the, the system here. Yeah. So, for example, a Nigerian that will go beside the roadside and urinate there. 
without anybody stopping. We go into a structured system and not try it. Nigerians are the most obedient and loyal people when it comes to, do you understand? So if you say don't go here, they would rather even stay here when it comes to those kind of systems. So I think it's more of a system thing. Put, make things, make the environment better, then you will see if we can be this productive. Anybody doing, Nigeria has the highest index on ease of doing business in Africa. Means that it is toughest to do business in Africa. But day by day, young people are creating businesses. People are doing multiple taxation, insecurity, everything, everything. People are struggling. If you go to the markets, even if you, let's break it down, go to places like Ladipo. When I go to those kind of places, sometimes I just sit and I just stand in a corner and just look at people. You will see people six hours, eight hours carrying iron. And they are doing it. You understand? Mm. So in terms of, we, we are doing, it's just that it's so, it's so painful that a little effort can be given like this. Mm. But huge effort is given this. So it seems like mm. no it's effort struggle. is going in because of the kind of structure. Well, an average person in the U.S., you know, will register a business one day. You know, come up with an idea. The, the structure is even there. There are loans. There are everything. PDK talked about getting loan from bank. I tried that some years ago. It took almost a year, and there was no shishi. Do you get the point? That alone is frustrating. If you have an idea, a year. A lot of, and you know, the idea is a lot of us here, have things, have ideas, and they're about, but there's no financing, no structure, no irrespective, people are still doing things. I dare to say again that Nigerians are the most productive in the world. Mm. <laughs> ah, okay, I don't know. Before I come to you, sir, hold on, sir. Um, any, uh, any questions from the, from the, from the congregation? Okay. Um, Okay, I wanted to ask him a question, though, but let me hear you. Just chip into this 30 seconds. And, yeah, very short. I just wanted to add, I can understand that, that uh, Brother Diadem is a very passionate person. And why won't any Nigerian be passionate? But I still want us to be able to distinguish that Nigerians are hardworking. That is no doubt. But I want us to also know that being hardworking is different from being productive. So you can be... You can be going nowhere very fast. Yes. That is the truth. So we should start to don't just carry, sit down. If, if every day you wake up, you carry iron, and that iron is giving you only food that you have to wake up tomorrow to carry another iron, it means you are not being productive, in my opinion. So Nigerians should start being more strategic about their productivity and not just be hardworking. All right, fantastic. Okay, you, you're chipping some. Thank you for, for adding that. Adding that perspective, and maybe that's what inspired me. Let's even look at the numbers. Because, I, I, like you said, I get Brother uh, Diadem's uh, perspective to it. We, we can. The potential is there. But no leader to launch it forth, you know. So there's a stunted kind of... Because if you look at the numbers, the, the, if you want to know productivity, you should look at your manufacturing. Yes. How much people are creating. That's productive. I mean, you, you, I mean, we see parable of the soil and everything like what PDK also introduced and what we've been teaching. Our exports and our import, just go and look at the numbers. Then you understand where our productivity lies. Yeah. 40 trillion, we bring in food and things we buy from other countries. 40 what? Trillion. And we, we are taking out maybe 4 trillion or maybe something... Within that's the manufact the, the things that come from our brain that oh we are creating yeah. maybe about I mean there's a lot to do in productivity so let's like you had, I distinguish there's hard working we are very hard working yeah. but productivity we're on a journey there you know mm. fantastic let's let's thank you <laughs> questions ah the crowd seems to be very okay okay, okay. Ah, okay now they're coming on comment okay so let's start with uh, her I saw her hand first. And then the gentleman in front, and then pastor, and then back to the auntie, our dear auntie at the back, the chairman. Sorry, I also want to comment this Anambra money. What economy is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry, ma. Okay, go ahead, ma. <laughs> um, thank you so much. This has really been, you know, very enlightening. I just wanted to add to what Brother Diadem said. So me, personally, I believe that Nigerians are productive. When we are in Nigeria, we are hardworking. 
But when we go out, we are productive. That's the thing. Because the outside of Nigeria, there's the enabling environment. You find out that in Nigeria, you put in half, I mean, you put in double the effort to get half of what they get abroad. That is frustrating. So personally, I have personal um, experiences, and I know a lot of people, that when they were in Nigeria, they were hustling. They were always hustling. You, know, you wake up early in the morning, you stress all through the day, yet you don't have anything to show for it. The moment they step abroad, they buy houses within six months. You know, young people that have so much to give to this country, they go abroad and then they start doing well. I know somebody that couldn't pass logic when we were in Ife. You know, philosophy, she couldn't. She just, logic, there's not, you don't have an in between in logic. It's either you know it or you don't know it. This girl went abroad, you know. She moved from philosophy, arts. She's an AI expert as we speak. Like she moved from art completely. At what age? Over 30. And she's an AI expert as we speak. So Nigerians are hardworking in Nigeria because the environment is not enabling enough. But when they go abroad, they are productive. Thank you, ma'am. Ma, you should, you should be a politician. Or you're, uh, I don't know what you're doing in that uh, retail thing. Okay. Yes. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Fashion retail. Okay. So I think um, the, the issue is the perspective of the average Nigerian is based on self. And we are only as intelligent as the problems we seek to solve. For instance, if I want to solve a problem in, um, um, let's say, finance, I begin to think finance, I begin to learn about it. Automatically, my knowledge in that area will grow. But the average Nigerian, has, as in the problem of the average Nigerian, has been dissolved to the, to the problem of having to meet basic needs. So we don't get to think beyond that. For an entire lifetime, that is what we think about. So our, our intelligence, our productivity is, is going to always evolve around that. And we can't necessarily blame people for that. It is just a perspective problem. When people are thinking of how to build something that will take us to space, others, people, others are thinking of how to even buy a plate of food. Others think of how to remove landlord from their budget. You know, and that's the problem. And talking about, talking about the numbers, you know, I think um, in economics, there are two um, indexes for measuring the GDP. We have real GDP and nominal GDP. The um, nominal GDP is false because it is a product of inflation. For instance, petrol and um, fuel used to, let's say petrol used to be um, 65 Naira. I think that was 2005, 2006. So let's say we exported 1,000 units, let's just say units. That means our GDP in that regard will be 1,000 times 65. But today, it is now how much? 165. So the GDP will be a bigger number. But that doesn't mean we are growing. It is infl as a matter of fact, it is bad. The real thing that is supposed to be the, norm, um, the real GDP, talking about measuring our productivity at a base price. So the figures they show to us is, 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 having a, is pregnant with inflation. It is because of inflation we are having those figures. Dollar is 500 Naira today. That is why we have a big number. It is not, it is GDP is price times quantity. What we export times the quantity, the amount times the quantity is the GDP. So if we are seeing big figures, it doesn't mean we are, we are having. If, the thing is, it doesn't matter how much people steal. If the money is excess, it will be excess. When Solomon was king in Israel, even servants, you understand, ate with plates of gold. So, so there, there's, a, there's a degree of growth and development we have that. These, these thieves and so on, you understand? What they, 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 they can't even have an impact on what is happening. And that also means we also have to begin to take individual, you know, measure your economy, have your own index. Like, okay, in this family, our goal is 100000 this year, $100,000. Let us work towards that as a family. And I think one of the hints, which is the wisdom God actually gave me, I think that was about two years ago, is look for the most lucrative industries in the world and look for something to make yourself relevant in any of them. I think it's as simple as that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together for... I mean, he made a very profound point with respect to the fact that, you know, where your eyes are. And I think uh, PDK used to tell me that a lot too, that sometimes it's just to lift you. See how you're looking? Just lift like this. And that's what he told Abraham, father of nations. If you can see beyond your survival, then you can become truly success, successful. And I think that's what people who have broken the barriers have done. They, they are, they're looking beyond themselves. 
And I think it's a very important paradigm for someone here to be liberated. That the moment you take the, the thing off you, literally, you will just see how you begin to grow. Pastor. Okay. Okay. Sorry, okay. Like Something to that before okay. we move on. Yes. Now, if you see Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the base of it are the basic needs. I want to say that you cannot jump the gun. If you have not sorted one level, you cannot move to the next before you move to the next. Now, the economy of our country makes it make a lot of people stuck in that basic place. And I used to tell a lot of young people that come to us to learn and they're about, I used to tell them, one of the biggest challenges you will have is your basic need. And I will tell them, find a way to sort that one. It might be something outside of what you are learning. It might be anything, it might even be a brother. Just find a way. I used to tell them, know how much you need to survive per month. If it is 30K you need to survive, know it. Then find a way to get that 30K. If you need to beg three brothers to get 30K, know that that is your strategy of solving that. If you need to do other odd jobs to do that 30K, do that. Then you can now focus on the other things you are doing that makes you grow. Because the things we do to get those basic things most times don't make us grow. And that is why majority of our people are not growing. So we are just always running after what to feed on. And we are not able to feel it to get to the next stage. So a lot of people, that is what is really not making people grow. So you can't tell me to be thinking space exploration when I, I don't even have a way of paying off. But, but or, you, but you brought a fantastic salary. balance. You said find a way to solve your, yeah. your yes. survival, yes. then focus on growth. Yes. So that's a good one. That means somebody needs to hear that. Today. Some of you need to go and take up odd jobs, literally. Yeah. And we can share ideas of some of those yeah. odd jobs shortly. Yeah. Some of them are fascinating. Yes, sir? Pastor. Sorry, the microphone for Pastor. Okay, Pastor, you're wired already. You're productive, <laughs> you're productive Pastor. <laughs> your productivity is switched on. You don't need any mic. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Should I pull it up? Anyway, um, I mean, thank you very much for, for the different perspectives. Um, so so there's, there's something, you know, a, a trend, you know, based on also examining why is this thing not trickling down that led to the concept of we need to engender inclusive growth. You know, that is a growth that is inclusive. It's not just stagnant, you know, at a certain level. And uh, the truth of the matter is that any society, I think someone really put it right, um, my brother, that you know, the average Nigerian is focused on himself. Um, there are a lot of people focused on survival. There is also um, a lot of people who don't have to focus on just surviving. Right now, there, there is a convoluted reason why things are not getting done. And I remember, I think it was one of the sessions I was having with uh, a group of guys that were really discussing the matter of productivity. And I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, and I'll use an example for us to understand because it's not, it's not just about what you produce. It's also, there's a time factor to it what you produce per, per time. In, in other words, how efficient are you? It also helps with, you know, how you can produce, okay? And that is why systems are also important. So a very good, plain example that I'm sure a lot of us can relate with. If you've used the roadside mechanic before, and you've also used, quote and unquote, corporate mechanic, you would see the difference. All right, you go to the corporate mechanic, in seconds, they've lifted your entire car. All right, and they're already working on what needs to get done. The roadside mechanic is, is, is spending time to jack one leg, he puts a stone there, goes, jacks another one, puts a stone there. So he's working hard, but the system to improve his output is not there. So, so and, and, and I thank God for, I think one of us is not in this TBC Abuja, you know, trying to do something with uh, World Bank around just facilitating, you know, growth of SMEs and all that. In other words, there is a world where you create a village for these artisans. All right? You look at the entire 
productivity. In other words, what they can produce. And you can quantify it and go to the bank and say, give us money. We need money for these equipment, right? You empower them with those equipment. These guys can do more part-time. And from their aggregate wealth, you are paying back the bank over time. And that also has ripple effect because you can also leverage economies of scale. So when one of them is billing and you know, maybe spending uh, 2,500 naira on engine oil you know, for a car, to service a car, together they can go to a mobile and negotiate and get that down to maybe one five. Because we are big off takers. So you have economies of scale. So you're able to reduce your cost, right? Be more productive. You have enough float, you know, to pay things back. These are the kind of solutions we actually need in our nation. And it can also be facilitated by entrepreneurs, corporate wealth, right? So I just thought to... Um... Okay, praise God, church. Hallelujah. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, so I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, so what does this have to do with um, faith? And I'll explain myself. So first of all, we had um, our wonderful brother here who was talking about um, individual uh, problems as it comes to economics, like thinking about survival and how to, um, solutions on how to um, think beyond your environment. And like brother Adam was saying, you know, look at the, um, foreign, you know, what can, what, what can I get, you know, from outside um, countries that are working? Okay, keep that in mind, right? And then, on this other hand, we are saying that the systems of government, like, the systems that government is not putting in place does not work. Now, why I'm talking about faith is because, like Brother Dalem was saying, sometimes, so I'm listening to the conversation, I'm back and forth, I'm back and forth. I haven't gotten a thread of to go home with, right? Because if I go home, I'm thinking... How do I get myself out of the blame game of government when it's still government, right? So, no, it's true. Because I'm going home and I'm thinking, okay, I want to use my technology laptop. And because Brother Diamond then was saying something that is striking me as odd. Why would you tell somebody to use any means to get 30K when the 30K that you're telling him use any means is not, going, it's not a day's job? If you say, use any means to get a TK, it's still what, Pastor, and what PDK was saying. It's still effort that you're going to use. If his own way to find a TK is limited by his exposure from childhood, if for me, my, my own effort to get a TK would be, my education would help me. The systems that were in place that I was able to get would help me. For another person that doesn't have all those privilege, his TK would literally be that iron. He cannot come out of that iron. Now, where does faith come in? And that's my question. What does this conversation present as faith to me? If I'm praying, God, help me to go beyond the boundaries of, like, because it, God is not, I don't know, God may not send an angel at the end of the day. Because I'm trying to fight hopelessness, right? Because if you say, these days I'm seeing that a lot of things have to do with privilege. I'm privileged. I went to good schools. I can, I can get a good salary now because of how I was born. But take, take another person in another environment, right? He's literally, 30K is like, you're, 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 you're telling him to get 30K. And that 30K is a fight. For you, you can have a laptop. You, you, even having a laptop for, for me would be that my intelligence has to mix with that laptop. Giving a poem as in somebody who is an injury, it will not do anything for him. He doesn't know what to do with that laptop, right? And if you say, use any means to get 30K, um, people are using any means, and they're killing people, and they're stealing, and that is, for them, it is life and death. Your conversation about going abroad, what our brother said here, it may look like a small thing. Some people have to steal, to live. I work, on, as in, I work in a place where I have to walk, as in, I have to trek home sometimes. On the bridge, I, 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 sometimes I see these um, children, these Almagiris, and I'm like, if not for God, eh, if, that's, if, if it's that my entire future is in the hands of this country, if it's not that God would find a way to help those Almagiris, eh, 
where you're going to start your conversation with them will be 50 years into their lives. Because they know their masters are begging. They know how to beg. You know how to go to market and price. They don't know how to say good morning without begging you. That's the entire thing, an entire programming. And I like what PDK said because it's like a solution. Because if you're thinking about it, in Nigeria, right, we have bad systems, right? But the Igbo, the Igbo mechanic, um, help your brothers, is flourishing. The Yaba man that you see with a techno phone that is with rubber band, go to his account. There's a system that they have where they help each other. They come together. I, I start my own shop, right? And it's, like someone said, um, I think two weeks ago, it's being studied in universities. I have, I have, I have my own um, shop. I, 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 I get money. Then the next person. And in a way, I see faith in it, right? It's, it's a kind of, it's a system built on love. I help my brother. So basically, my, 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 my own question, let me, let, me, let me just go to my point. My, my question is this. In as much as we are saying that the government is fighting, the way I'm seeing it from my own chair is it's still the government that is a problem, right? So what's practical, I beg you, practical knowledge can I go home with today? Because if you tell me to fight for 30K, I will only fight for as much as I know, right? Is it going to be saying, Chemaka, when you have money, go and help your brother, let it keep multiplying? Or would it? Because if you're telling me to use what I have, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm, even, the, even the foreign uh, money that I can get from my job, I still, do you know I'm fighting to pay for courses that I cannot pay for? The kind of level of education that I have now, I need more money to get there. Okay, you know what I'll do? I, I don't worry. I, I, I know. Yeah, you have you have a cut my shout. They've cut my shout you now. Oh, don't mind me, guys. I'm not. Thank you, uh, Sir Chairman. Please, let's take all the questions together. One, two. I would use that opportunity for us to close out. So when I take all the questions, you would, you have to, can you take notes? Uh, you know, all the questions. Then you would answer them and use that to conclude your case. Then we'll close the show before Raymond has my head like John the Baptist for lunch. All right. Yes, sir. Praise God. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to say, um, first of all, let's think of the beginning. When God created Adam, what did God tell Adam? You know, God created Adam and God did not give Adam a written constitution. Just like um, when God gave Moses law to give the children of Israel, it was because they were becoming unruly. So God had to give them law to restrict them from doing certain things. So that means if we keep depending on the government of Nigeria and their constitution, will be as though we are unruly. So what God gave Adam was a law for himself, which is personal government, self-government. So God expected Adam to rule himself. That's why at the end, God says his law will be on our heart. So there is a government you need to govern yourself with. And that is why you were originally designed to produce something but God shows you the things around you that he can use in producing something that makes you relevant. So God right, God out to tell Adam that somewhere there is gold. So he can use the gold for something. God didn't give him chair. He gave him tree. So from the tree, he brought out the chair. Now, there is something I can do. No matter how bad the situation of Nigeria is, I can make myself relevant. Even as bad as it is, I can attract value. Because money is attracted to solution. If you are not solving anything, you will make money. So like Pastor said, you know, money should move in the direction of productivity. If I'm producing nothing, then I should expect nothing. And what people need as capital, most times is not money, is your integrity. I remember one time I learned how to make shoe. I, I ran the business for some time, but the way I started, I didn't have one year to start. But I kept on telling people, I make shoes, I make shoes. Because of people's trust that I have, someone will say, okay, make one for me, I make two. I started having extra until I had about 30 pairs of shoe and 50 pairs of shoe. So most time we don't need money. What we need is your own integrity, then advertise yourself to people. No matter how bad the situation is, you can still attract value in the country. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for that fantastic perspective. Thank you. Um, are, those, are those all the questions? Okay, I think... Uh, is it a comment? No, uh, we Okay, I mean, just talk in 30 seconds. I mean, let's have mercy. 30 seconds. Hey, Joe. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, to align with what Pastor said, because I have been having that in mind for a long time, 
like creating a village. I like solution. A village whereby we have a lot of young people who have gone to learn skills in various areas. So, and at the end of the day, they do not have shops where to establish and start their, uh, their skills. So why don't we, those that are capable, according to what Pastor Deji said at the altar, to um, get loans. We are not able to get these loans because it takes time. So if you have that avenue of how these loans could be gotten for these young people, just as her member is doing at Abuja, we could replicate that in Lagos State or in any other state to create a village, a technical village for people like, like what is happening in, um, um, at Keja, where we have computer village. Okay. We can as well have such village over in Lekki or any other areas okay. where we do things like that. Okay, thank you very much. I, I will also speak to that. Maybe we'll see after church with Pastor and discuss how the church can start creating opportunities, an ecosystem that works. All right, I think we have to cut it down. Okay, he was raising us just 30 seconds. I want to ask, yes, sir. which one is more important to God and to, to faith? To I mean, we are believers. At the end of the day, what is more paramount? What is more reward for? Which, which is weightier? To be successful personally, I mean, cater for your family, you are, you know, you meet your demands and then you're able to help one or two, you know, or to be able to create, to make change like in your environment and like you leave an indelible mark. You might not make so much money, you might not even have a car or maybe, you know, you might look as though you struggled in life, but you changed people you changed you made impact or i'm successful personal productivity i have money now i'm doing business i'm earning forex my, my children are going to good schools and maybe i leave something for them when i die they do that kind of barrier for me you know and all of that which one like can we set it now which one is more you know after life or in eternity to god and all of that can i don't know can somebody give me that Answer. Okay, all right, no problem. So let's, uh, let's run like this. Since you didn't, let me, or you want to go like this? Anyone? Okay, it looks like, okay, I'll come like this. So the pastor, you give us some spiritual. Like, all right. Yeah, praise God. Praise God. Okay, so um, there's a lot to say, but I think I will start with what Phil said last. Um, I believe that it's not two different lives, you know? your goal, your purpose in life, what God has called you to do, it's not separated from all these things we are talking about. So being, um, I believe that you, you can fulfill your purpose in life. If, you're, if your purpose, it's not everybody that is called to minister to people. For some people, it's to create system. For some people, even in that business you are doing, it will still facilitate. Do you understand? So it's a, it's a noble call for everybody to say, I want to live my life to impact lives or thereabout. It might not be your call as a person. Do you get the point? And you trying to grow your business to be successful, number one, it depends on your definition of success to start with. So growing your business to be successful and somebody else is using his own time, energy, and resources to train and help people, do you understand? Does not mean that you are doing God's work lesser than that person is doing because we are all called in different dimensions. Do you get the point? So we should not see it from a perspective of this person is doing business, is growing his business, is making money, is not as religious or as spiritual as us that we are using all of our resources. If that is your call and you are truthful to it, then it is success to you. Do you understand? Our environment defines other things as success. And I don't think anybody should not be able to at least yes. meet their basic needs. So I don't think that's... Yeah. I'll start the next so, question. Okay, so yeah, that's one. Um, two, I wanted to talk about what Sister Elizabeth said. Um, I want to say to young people, and I will add it to Sister Ma Chiamaka's question. Now, that, what I said initially was that I didn't say any means like carry gun, no. 
so when I said any means, I mean I meant any other work means to get the result. And what I've shared is not because you said you wanted a practical. I will share a bit of my own experience. It's hundred percent practical. I started a company in Ibadan, and by Ibadan scale, I was doing fantastically well until I came to Lagos and I saw things were different. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any, like you, I didn't go to good schools. In fact, my English is just getting better. It was worse before. Do you understand? I don't have that privilege. So to anybody else here, don't look and say, these guys are privileged. That is why. No, it is not. He just took a decision to say, no, I'm going out of here. And I want to. I closed up a company that had eight staff, sent them packing to come to Lagos to also as an individual person. It took faith. Doing that kind of thing is not, is not uh, random. It is faith. So all those these things we are saying, even learning a new skill, believing that you will know it and make something good out of it, is faith. Me sitting on this chair now is even me having faith in this chair that it will be able to take me because it's not all chairs that can carry me. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> Do you get the point? Yeah. <laughs> Do you get the point? So don't, don't, What's we used to make concept of faith want to stand like, no, there is, faith is not outside of every single thing we have mentioned here. So if you are learning a new skill, if you are going global, if you are remaining here, if you are expanding out in any direction, you are putting your faith to work as a believer. And it is that faith, you having that belief in it, that will also even make it happen. And, you know, I can personally tell you tons of examples of where people put faith to work in this line of these people that started on this 30K scale, putting their faith to work, and they are now hanging big and doing well now. So it's 100% practical. It's not uh, outside of it. Now, calling to what Sister Elizabeth said, I think that one of the problems in the country is that many of us always sit for someone to provide a solution to our problems. Anywhere where problems are much, there are opportunities there. You yourself, don't wait for somebody to do an ecosystem. Don't wait for somebody to put, because what PDK said, I don't know, from where I stand, is not an easy thing to achieve. And I think even handing down loans to people will most likely end in premium tiers. That is my own opinion. Because, you know, I think it's not the, the, the first direction to go. Because the way people handle money, you yourself, what is their highest amount of money that have entered your account? How did you use it? What result came out of it? First do an estimate of that, and now really think if money is the problem. Our brother said, most times money is not the problem. So let's take our eyes out of there. You have a skill as a person. Begin to look for opportunities. Put your faith to work. Put yourself out there, and you will see things begin to work for you. The grace is there, but if you sit at home and you are having faith, you are declaring at home, nothing will happen. In fact, you might not eat that night until you step out and you begin to engage that your faith in the market. So I believe that as believers, more than any other person that just goes to a newspaper stand to complain every day, we need to rather be putting that our faith to work to get results. So uh, that is my uh, comment on that. My general comment as we close is that it seems like from the way we have talked, people need to leave. I used to say that you don't always need to live physically, but mentally you need to live. So even if you are here, there are ways legally that you can register your business outside of this country. Begin to study. The internet is now free and available. Research what happens in other places. Don't watch African Magic Yoruba every time. Spend some time watching some things that are outside. You know, expand your mind, expand your thinking. You will, see, you will see what other people that have your skills are doing out there. And you can compete on a level playing ground. Legally now, you can have a US number, a US account, a US business registered. Legally. And you can operate in the US, even pay tax, and get your money remitted to you back here. You are earning good for it. And I don't see. Tell me what you do. I will tell you how it is relevant elsewhere. So... You don't, let, if you have the money, if you have the resources and you want to leave, if God is telling you to leave, probably you should go. But for majority of us that are staying here, you need to, in your mind, leave. Put things out of till 
And as a person individually, you know, contribu continue to contribute to the economy. And when God saves Nigeria as a whole, then, you know, yeah, thank you. No, no, if you come on, if you come on. Come on. I'm oh, dead. Yeah. Uh, Radadem was speaking to a lot of things that I just ah, written out. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was just going to talk uh, about um, Phil's question where he was like, uh, which do you choose? Which is more important in the eyes of God? And like Radadem says, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I can be successful in any how I define success and I can still have impact. And I think that's even the will of the Father, that you are able to provide bread for your family and you are also able to impact other people. So we should not be looking for a way to now say which one. I don't think that's really what God is interested in. He wants you to make impact and also make wealth. Um, uh, I, I can understand Sister Chiamaka's uh, passion around... The truth is, faith has everything to do with it. That's the truth. Uh, the fact that you are, you, are, you are tilling the ground, you are hoping that rain is going to fall, that is faith. So... Everything you are doing, you should know that the, um, you should just do it with the with the hope that God is going to bless the work of your hand. Sister Elizabeth's question about um, I, I I see a lot of times we talk about ah oh, give them loan, give them finance. I I agree with Brother Adam hundred percent. I feel like this fine. It's a big issue. It's a big thing. But I was watching one um one um pitch. A lady was trying to get the venture capitalist to sort of. And after she said, she had this beautiful idea, and PDA always talks about idea. The idea was beautiful. Like PDA said that um, if, you, if, you, if, you don't, uh, if you don't understand the idea, so it will be taken away from you. She, after she finished pitching and she was asking for, I think, 70,000 US dollar, then the lady, all the venture capitalists on the panel said, well, this your idea is fine, but I don't think I'm ready to do it. Somebody else now says, okay, I like your idea. I'm going to give you the money you want, but I'm going to take 60% of the business. And she was like, no, 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 she did. You know, eventually ended up, she, I don't have the idea, but I now own 60% of the business. That's because this is the person that has the business acumen to do it. So it's not always about giving money, it's about mentorship and all that. So my own closing thoughts, I feel like uh, we have emphasized the fact that we know the government has a lot to do. And we have talked about building ourselves, but I want to talk to us as um, people who may eventually be, in, be policy makers. Uh, let's not look at ourselves small. Uh, some of us might get there. So there are some key things I feel like any government should look at so that they can make the government and um, the economy uh, business friendly. One of it, I feel like uh, the first thing is security. Uh, get make your, the nation secure, then a united nation, that is where all of us we have to play. So if we start seeing ourselves as one Nigeria, or at least we start seeing, we start the cultural, the nation, religious, everything, we remove it, we remove that mindset, it, it will help us, a healthy nation, uh, health infrastructure, we look at it, we solve it. Then competitiveness, I feel like the government is trying, but uh, if I if I start saying all the things the government is doing, the payback reforms, finance at Kama, I, I feel like some of us will be like, what is all this? <laughs> what is all this? But the government is doing a lot to make ease of business, ease of doing business um, better. But one key thing I feel the government should also do is accountability. By the time the government is accountable to the resources it has that we have given, I pay my tax to you, account for it. If governments know that they are going to be accountable for these resources, they will use it well. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sorry, can, I, can I just... Okay. You know, there, there is a general impression, and I think it's important to... based on also experience. You know, not my personal experience, but people in the market. Um, the funny thing is people who operate at below the pyramid, doing business <laughs> there, they will tell you that they are more credit worthy than even the eight to five, nine to five more privileged people, okay? They will actually tell you that. I know someone who said my MPL is zero, is zero, because their, 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 their livelihood literally depends on it. 
right? But apart from that, um, that system of providing infrastructure is not putting money in their pocket. You know, it's not personal loan. It's, it's an aggregation. And the, the revenue is not coming directly. There's a system that does collection. There's a system that does repayment. And, you know, there's a risk, uh, you know, uh, mitigator, mitigation criteria that ensures that that, you know, that can work. And I really believe that's, that's something. If you pack tailors, maybe Emmanuel will talk to that in closing remarks. If you put tailors together, it probably gives some economics around production of just white shirts. Just shirt production. And they are not having to do all those manual. You put, you know, industrial equipment there for people to sit down at scale. You don't want to know what that what that means in a society. And those are, those are solutions we actually should be brokering across board to help alleviate poverty. PDA, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I will just talk um, to the gospel. As in, of course, a lot, a lot has been said on the, on the, yeah. I mean, these are professors. <laughs> And brother, they're doing amazing work in the market. You know, the gospel is the solution to poverty. Let's not even try to overanalyze the issue. And if you're a Christian or a believing person here today, I don't see any other way. And I will still go back to what Christ said. Because governments of the world, they're also like businesses. They just can't create opportunities just like that. Because everything they do also has impact, you know, across board. So you just have to sometimes just assume that, okay, well, maybe whatever policies they are creating is not favoring me, but I'm sure it's favoring some other people, and which is true, you know. You know, in the days of Christ, um, taxes were a problem because the Roman government was an expansionary. They spent a lot on their military. That's because they wanted to dominate the world. So it was a very sensitive issue in their economy, taxes as in pay heavily in taxes. And with the kind of sensation that Jesus had created, you know, I mean, strong following, it was a very cheap way to trap him. Yeah. You understand? And which is why they came to him and said that, um, do you think we should pay taxes to Caesar? That was a wicked question. Because if he had mentioned something contrary, a revolt could start, and it was have been a very fine opportunity to nail. In fact, they had to get some of their finest minds to research into that question. And, and Jesus, you know why I adore Christ? I mean, if you come to Ali, you just see how much I just adore teaching. He's, just, he's, he's not naive. Christ is not naive. He's a, he was, he's a brilliant economist. And he, he said something that is important. He said, give me the money in your hand. He said, whose picture is here? He said, they say it is Caesar's image. <laughs> he just smiled. He said, this is Caesar's money. So give to Caesar what belongs to him and give to God what belongs to God. And it is true. Because as far as any government is concerned, government's true earning is taxes. You cannot, it, just the way you have a small business, Abby, and you want to make revenue, right? So that you can have more money to spend, right? On your line. Taxes is the revenue of government. So for them to continue to run their vision, to even make life better for you, you have to pay taxes. But what God, Christ was just trying to tell him, them, that look, there's a system of governance that is run by Caesar. If he's the one that prints the money in your pocket, you have to pay tax to him. Are you with me? But he also said that, he said, give to God what belongs to God. And that is that God also has his economy, which is another loop entirely. It is in that economy that the church is meant to train you so that you understand how God creates something out of nothing. Yeah. Hallelujah. So, the gospel, the whole idea is to plant the seed of the word in your heart. And you take that and start to create, you know, something out of nothing. Government earns in taxes. God earns in souls. And what that means is that whatever it is God is giving to you, it cannot deplete the quality of your soul. And whatever it is that you are after, 
God's own balance is that your soul must appreciate with everything you get in this world. My advice, whatever it is that you do, you know, I always tell young entrepreneurs and everyone that want to start out, I think you should focus on how, just focus on other people, how you can be a blessing, you know, how you can genuinely be a blessing. Nigeria is difficult, but I think you'll be happier if you can understand your capacity to increase the happiness of another person. And that is just, and that can come at no cost, you know. So I just keep it there, you know, thank God. Hallelujah. 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 I, I wish, we're going now, I promise, sir. I wish I had spoken before you so that you could, this is a perfect end. But just to throw in what Pastor asked for, and just to give us perspectives in line with what you're saying, sir, is that if you want to make 30 million white shirts, you know, white shirts that we wear, and trousers and shirts, you know, ready-made in a year, you need 250 machines, right, there about in one facility, and you need 84 factories, 84, 84. You now understand the challenge when churches are buying factories and converting them to auditoriums. It's, this is some of the things you don't know. And then it will create 33,000 jobs. That's what it takes. You know, there's some people we're talking to on this issue, and that's how I got these numbers. They gave it to me. But the point is that when they're talking about jobs, you know, Bangladesh has become a hub now. 4.4 million people. 4.4 million people in Bangladesh work in this white shirt business. And this 4.4, yes. Now, Bangladesh is predicted in the next five years to become a middle-income country. They're on their way. They had a plan on this, let's focus on these clothes, and they are doing $33 billion. In 2019, they did $33 billion in net exports from these white shirts. Guess what, guys? Nigeria's oil was about 40-something. So it means if we just did white shirts too, hello, or any of these things, this is just garment too. I'm not going into cotton. I'm not going into textile. I'm not going into uh, cocoa, uh, gold. So... We really, but that productivity, you know, and I believe all things they've shared, but just like Pastor said, you know, the, the, the gospel that is being preached, like the man that goes to, you know, all the parables of Jesus, very powerful parables, but here's the one I want to use to close. This will be sounding, you see, Joseph was a slave. Listen, Joseph was a slave. Please remember. And he rose to be prime minister. You and I don't have any excuse. One of the greatest ones, and she's talking about Jibo people, it's servanthood, apprenticeship. So some of you, when you need to go back, start from not slavery, go and do house help. Walk your way up. Because if you work for some people as house help, you go home with 600,000 at the end of the year. Because they will feed you, they will clothe you. So what is the problem? You are up and running. So the Bible said we teach children in church. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you have to learn to be what? A servant of all. I pray that God will bless us on this new journey. Have a good afternoon. I'm not saying we should go and be house help. So you understand what I'm saying?